There's no denying that Dolly Parton is an American institution and a country music legend. But despite her distinguished career as a singer, writer, actor, and director, Dolly has endured an incredible number of challenges and tragedies throughout her life. From her humble beginnings to her early struggles to her darkest moments, here's the tragic real-life story of Dolly Parton. Dolly Parton was born in 1946 in a one-room cabin in Locust Ridge, Tennessee, the fourth child of an illiterate sharecropper and a housewife who birthed 12 kids before the age of 35. Life wasn't exactly easy for the Parton family. The nights were excruciatingly cold. She shared a bed with her younger siblings, and the children often had to wash in a river using soap they made themselves. But Parton isn't bitter about her hard scrabble roots. In fact, she told People Magazine that she's grateful for the lessons her parents taught her in thrift and financial responsibility. She said, no matter how much money I make, I'll always count my blessings quicker and more often than I count my money. Luckily, Parton's wild and free-ranging childhood in the Appalachian Mountains has provided endless songwriting inspiration. One of her first big hits, Coat of Many Colors, tells the story of a coat a mother lovingly sews for her daughter out of donated rags. The coat draws mockery from the girl's schoolmates, but she knows that while her family might be short of money, they're at least rich with love. It's no surprise that story has its roots in Parton's own childhood. Parton learned to love music thanks to her mother's side of the family, and much of her knowledge of gospel, country, and bluegrass came courtesy of her maternal grandfather, a Pentecostal preacher. My mother's people were very musical, so music was not rare in our family. There were always instruments around. Everybody played some sort of a musical instrument. Parton started writing songs at the age of seven, got her first guitar at eight, and began performing on television at ten. The day after she graduated high school, she left her home in the Appalachian Mountains for Nashville in the hopes of finding fame in the country music capital of the world. The road to success rarely runs smooth, however, and Parton, who wanted to record country songs, was shoehorned by her label into the pop genre because executives thought her looks and voice were ill-suited to country. It took some time, but she was eventually allowed to make the kind of music she wanted to, and her debut country single, Dumb Blonde, made it to number 24 in the charts. After that, the hits kept coming, and in 1967, Monument Records released Hello, I'm Dolly, the album that made it clear once and for all that Parton was always destined for bluegrass and not bubblegum. In 1967, following the release of Hello, I'm Dolly, Parton was handpicked by Nashville legend Porter Wagoner to appear on his roadshow and television variety program. Wagoner was immediately bewitched by the 20-year-old Parton's beauty, brains, and talent. She found it more difficult to win over his fans, however, who were more used to seeing a songstress named Norma Jean by his side. But Norma Jean had bowed out of the show in order to get married. Parton, meanwhile, didn't exactly get a warm welcome during her first appearances on the show. A number of audience members even greeted her by chanting Norma Jean's name. But it didn't take long for Parton to win over Wagoner's most loyal watchers, and it was with her help that the Porter Wagoner show rocketed to the top of the television ratings. At the height of their fame, Parton and Wagoner were drawing a weekly viewership of 3.5 million, and their duets are considered some of the best co-ed efforts of the country music genre. This may come as a surprise to fans of Dolly Parton and Whitney Houston, but the tear-jerking ballad I Will Always Love You isn't really about a romantic love affair at all. It's about a professional partnership that had run its course. In 1974, Parton was 28 years old and intent upon pursuing a solo career. But that meant breaking up with her longtime mentor, collaborator, and friend, Porter Wagoner. She'd been appearing on his television show for seven years. And for Parton, who had only planned to stay on the show for five years, it was long past time to go out on her own. Parton believed she had paid her dues, but Wagoner disagreed. In fact, he was distraught over her decision to leave and tried to talk her out of it. So Parton tackled the situation the best way she knew how, by writing a song. After confronting Wagoner, she went home and wrote, I Will Always Love You. The next day, she performed it for him, and deeply touched, Wagoner agreed to let her go. Although that seems like a nice enough ending for this story, things didn't stay so rosy between the two. In fact, Wagoner went on to sue Parton for breach of contract, and the two feuded for years afterwards, before finally calling a truce and ending up friends. True to the spirit of the song, Parton was by Wagoner's side when he died in 2007. Growing up in a large, impoverished family, Parton often mothered her siblings. Later, when she moved to Nashville to pursue a singing and songwriting career, she even brought a number of her brothers and sisters and their children to live with her. And when she married her husband, Carl Thomas Dean, in 1966, the two lovebirds talked about having children. According to an interview with Parton in The Guardian, she and her husband wondered what their kids would be like, threw names around, and dreamed of becoming parents. But nothing happened. Parton's childbearing years came and went, and she and Dean eventually faced the fact that they would never have children of their own. Parton is very much accepting of her childlessness. In fact, she celebrates it. 
If she'd become a mother, she's not sure she would have been able to tour as she has, or become the star she was probably always meant to be. And now she's also become a mother figure to thousands of children all over the world who have the privilege of reading her children's books, enjoying her songs meant for young listeners, and benefiting from her charity, Imagination Library, which has donated more than 100 million free books to kids. Maybe it's because her first big hit was Dumb Blonde, but for years, people dismissed Dolly Parton as something of a small brain ditz, enslaved to plastic surgery and obsessed with the spotlight. Even renowned feminist Barbara Walters was pretty harsh towards Parton in a 1977 interview. Walters even went so far as to suggest that Parton was little more than a joke. But the thing about Dolly is that she's really damn smart. Not only is she funny and brilliant and quick on her feet, but she also clearly knows how to build an empire from pretty much nothing, hence her estimated net worth of $500 million. Of course, Parton would be the first to say that money isn't everything, which is true. And it's also true that she's never thought of herself as a pretty girl, so she piles on the makeup and the high hair and pours herself into high heels to try to enhance what God gave her. But you also can't argue with the kind of success she's achieved, or with her colorful comeback to Barbara Walters' wrong-headed condescension. For a long time, Dolly Parton was infamously apolitical. She and the very liberal Jane Fonda even made sure to stay away from discussing politics while on the set of 9 to 5 in order to keep the peace. Over time, though, Parton has had politics thrust upon her, namely in the area of gay rights. Ever since the 80s and 90s, she has been a gay icon and go-to for drag queens around the world. Since then, Parton has embraced the gay community in a myriad of ways, including devoting a special day to the LGBTQ community at her Dollywood theme park in Pigeon Forge, Tennessee. That move invited the ire of the local chapter of the Ku Klux Klan, whose members have protested Dollywood's so-called gay day and periodically rattled the singer with threats against her life. Obviously, however, Parton isn't one to be intimidated by hate groups. She later told the New York Daily News, If I was gay, I would have come out of the closet just a flyin. Having lived for over eight decades, Dolly Parton has experienced her fair share of loss, but perhaps one of the most tragic losses in a long line of them has been that of her niece, Tever Parton, who died of a drug overdose at age 36. Dolly had been trying to help Tever overcome her problems with addiction and even paid to send her to rehab, but in the end, the mother of two succumbed to her substance abuse. Just a month prior to Tever's death in April of 2017, Parton saw the passing of her manager, Don Warden, whom she'd met in 1967 on the set of The Porter Wagoner Show. Warden died at age 87 of natural causes. Parton responded to Warden's death with the perfect line, which of course she wrote herself, I will always love you. When Dolly Parton opened her country western theme park, Dollywood, she did so with history firmly in mind. The land the park stands on has a storied past, having served as an attraction in the Pigeon Forge area since 1961 when it was the Rebel Railroad. Parton bought the property in 1986, added a number of new attractions, and since then, Dollywood has become one of America's most popular theme parks. But it has also seen a spate of serious injuries, leading to a number of lawsuits and plenty of bad press. The most recent of these lawsuits was brought by a mother of two who claims that her experience on the River Rush water coaster ended with partial paralyzation. According to TMZ, the woman was propelled off her seat and struck her spine on a hard surface. As of 2019, she's suing Parton for $2 million. Another such case put the spotlight on Dollywood's safety record in 2014. A woman fell and struck her head on the pavement while exiting one of the park's swing rides. She suffered spinal and neck injuries, as well as a broken jaw, and sued for $475,000. The two parties settled out of court. Dolly Parton has always been an optimist, and hey, anyone who's lived her kind of rags-to-riches story would be. But being an optimist doesn't mean that your life or your mental health are in perfect condition, and there was a time when she got so low, she contemplated ending it all. This dark period came back in the early 80s when she had what she would later call an affair of the heart. Parton has been married to her husband Carl Dean since 1966, and the emotional cheating she felt she had committed sent her into a deep depression. According to People magazine, the fallout from the affair led to her binge eating, which gave rise to a number of health issues. She was also juggling family drama at the time and had been receiving random threats against her life, and had just finished a nightmarishly difficult ordeal on a film project. She even canceled a spate of performances and bowed out of the entertainment business for two years. At her lowest point, she found herself weighing up whether or not to take her own life. Then her dog Popeye came running up the stairs, and the pitter-patter of his nails shocked her back to reality. 
She considers Popeye's appearance at that pivotal time as a message from God and credits her own brush with rock bottom with helping her understand the often desperate plights of others. I've done something good. I've done plenty bad, I'm sure. But I just hope that I'll be remembered well. If you or anyone you know is having suicidal thoughts, please call the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline at 1-800-273-TALK-8255.